Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Chris Bercher. This is Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom, and this is episode 118, Let's Talk About Sex, Part 2. You probably need to watch 117, and really the, the previous 116 episodes, to follow what I'm getting ready to talk about. <laughs> And uh, I hope you found the title interesting, and we'll go back and at least watch the previous episode, because what I'm talking about is the evolutionary significance of sex. And I'm, I'm, I'm working towards something here. If you remember the episode 115 or 16, was, they're about love. And I've just recently come, almost become nauseatingly obsessed with this idea of love and where it comes from and what it means and and why it's here and... and um, and, and it, it, all this because I've had multiple experiences really over the last 30 years and probably my whole life where the, the best I've felt when I get into these sort of pseudo psychedelic spiritual places. And, and we've all been there, whether it happens like on a roller coaster or on a particularly pretty day at the beach or at a concert where you just have these like moments a flow or or connectivity or I don't know I don't know I just all I can do is talk about the similarities because I've had dozens of these things sometimes they've happened to me during meditation sometimes they've happened when I've been really sick and had fever so a lot of them happen on psychedelic drugs sometimes smoking weed um, during sex I mean there are just moments I've had where I have these feelings and the feelings have characteristics and the more work I do on trying to be, be the person I want to be, personal growth, I don't know what you want to call it, the more I find myself arriving at this place, this feeling of l- energy flowing through and out of me. And that similarity, this, this, this recurrence of this same feeling, that's the, the, the cohesive theme. And... The more I have this, the more I realize that I don't have any other way to talk about it but to call that love. So I want to know why we do this as humans, right? And the best explanation that I can come up with is it's related to sex. And so in the previous episode, I talked about the evolutionary significance of sexual reproduction and how it creates variation. And really, we started off as just being not genderless entity, biological entities that have the same problem we have today. Our life cells die, but our genes can live forever by being passed from individual to individual over time. And so that's sort of the underlying theme of life is that there's a time factor, there's a death factor, and there's a a loophole, (laughs) if you will. And it's not easy, like I said before, to envision some science fiction world where DNA is actually the individual and it's created life as a a vehicle that makes it live, kind of like a virus does with a host or a parasite. Fun to think about. Anyway, what's, what's more fun to think about and what's important to think about is really the justification for love as a critical part of life. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm working towards. Again, it makes me want to barf to even think about that, but I think it's worth exploring because it's like in the most Cartesian, like Rene Descartes kind of way is I've denied this, doubted this for as long as I can. And the evidence keeps pointing towards it. And so I feel compelled to follow this investigation um, wherever it takes me. And so that's what this is all about. And so what I talked about last time is the idea with the onset of sexual reproduction, now we have genders. Now we have an individual producing this kind of gamete, sperm or, 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 or pollen, the male. Well, it's all arbitrary what we call them. And another one producing this other kind of gamete, the egg or the ovum. Those two things having to get together to produce a new organism. And with the capacity to respond to the change in the environment because now it's reproducing sexually, which creates more potential for variation. It mixes the genes up more instead of just trying to copy them exact verbatim, right? So think about that. That's giant. And I think we can trace back all of our differences, you know, to that point, whether what the reason for that was, I I can only presume to be, the environment changes a lot. Asexual reproduction doesn't really prepare us very well for that because we keep making more of the same thing. Well, if the environment's getting warmer or colder or rainier, or 
whatever, then we're not going to be very, you know, by producing a bunch of things that aren't fit in that environment, it's like throwing, you know, the baby out with the bathwater or throwing good money after bad or bad. I don't know what you want to call that, but it's just not, not the best. Right. And so theoretically evolution selected for this potentially random mutation of sexual reproduction. Okay. I have a lot of experience with fish uh, and some insects and interest in birds. I'm trying to think about what would go back farther than that. You know, I, 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 I have a lot of zoology background, and so I've looked at the evolution of sexual reproduction through the animal kingdom. Um, but what's going to appeal to everybody really is to think about primates and humans and um, the consequences of that. And one, and not the least of which, is probably sexual dimorphism. So at first, you're probably hermaphrodites. You produce both parts, but you still have to get together. Like, let's take coral. That's probably a good one. So coral just release their gametes into the water column. And individuals are going to be producing both sperm and egg, but you put it up all in the water column, and then what happens is your sperm will recognize another coral's egg, and, and that induces the necessary variation because the parents are different at that level. And then those things will be, form a, a, a functional zygote that now has the right number of chromosomes and DNA. It'll fall to the f- ocean floor and it will create a new individual or whatever. So that's one way to do it. All the way up to choosing a mate based on appearance or the potential to be a good mate or be able to provide resources and then you know selecting and then all this mess in between for example live bearing fishes guppies that actually have internal fertilization just like more like a human they don't produce eggs and lay eggs they have internal fertilization through a fertilization tube from the male into the female the eggs are fertilized and and develop inside the female and then are born alive and ready to live on their own. I mean, all kinds of variation in this world. I mean, all of it. And of course, we're all obsessed with it. We used to joke in graduate school that all graduate students are obsessed with sex because we think the coolest part of the organisms we study is their sexual behavior. And it's all, it's all related to this, right? It's all related to strategies to, I mean, presumably the underlying assumption is we want to produce the most, f- you know, think about it. You're going to reproduce. Now it's entirely energetically costly. You don't just go through cell division and pop a couple babies out. You don't just release gametes into the water column once a year. Parental care becomes a variable as we become more and more derived and we move away from the more and more ancestral conditions. And so there's a, an energetic cost to sexual reproduction. That would be like in the cons <laughs> column opposite the pros is that it takes more energy. And so if you're going to invest all this energy into it, you, you, you sort of want to, to, to ensure that you're doing this for a better outcome. And so we assume that all these weird things surrounding sex that make it interesting, uh, are important, you know, and have some an advantage. Now that's not necessarily true, especially in the context of evolution and natural selection, we haven't really like sorted it out yet. And just, we haven't let the, you know, another example I always think of is some of these birds that have this ridiculous plumage where the male is just like, like a peacock, incredibly energetically costly feathers. And then the dances and they have to sort of like impress the females to get the female to select them. You know, that's a lot of energy. And now whether or not that is a good strategy, because to me, if that's going on in the jungle and this bird is like showing off with all these colors, a predator is going to be like, there's an easy target, <laughs> right? So we don't know if we're seeing a snapshot of evolutionary time and those sort of choices or selected for traits will be worked out. But presumably if they've been around for hundreds of thousands of years or even thousands of years, they must be pretty good. And so you see all this variation ranging from, and it, it really this is all related to sexual dimorphism and gender, you know, some um, sexually reproducing organisms don't look any different. Mom, dad, look the same. Nobody can tell the difference. A lot of fish are like this. Sometimes the female is a little bigger because they have to hold, they need a body that will hold more eggs. 
because eggs are bigger, eggs are going to be developing, they have the dig yolk, they got to be nutritious, you know, there's a lot more going on than with sperm, and that's a general trend that I think is fascinating, and I think supports a more matriarchal society, is that in almost every case, female gametes are more energetically costly than male gametes for all the reasons that I just said. Therefore, I would think that everything else that evolved with that, there, there would be more protection. One male across the boards of sexual reproduction can fertilize hundreds, if not thousands of females. That's not true with the female. You know? And so it's not hard to, to, to think that the female gender, and these words are weird because I see gender more as a continuum, and it's actually like that in the animal kingdom too, just, you know, numerically speaking, more often you have a stereotypical male that just produces sperm and then does all the things, and the female that just produces eggs and does all those things. But there's a lot going on in the middle. So an, a female, you would think, would be the one controlling, more controlling, more selective uh, as an individual behavior. And that's just another element of this. And so the first, the first cut, you know, is dimorphism. And some things look exactly the same, only they know the difference. Or like with the coral, they don't care. They just shoot the gametes out and they're like, good luck, kids. Um, all the way up to, you know, the humans who carry around a developing infant for nine months. And who's doing that? Not the dads. Anyway, so that's the first cut. And so with sexual dimorphism, there's the whole recognition part of that, right? The whole sensory, like, how do we know? Especially the ones that don't look different. You know, there's a whole pheromone thing. There's this whole development of differential chemistry that sort of says, you know, sniff, sniff, I'm a girl. Sniff, sniff, I'm a boy. You know, whatever it is to be like, how, how do we know? Um, so that's a, another level. Uh, and then it's like, okay, what... Besides just attraction, and there, there's a big word, right? That becomes important. You need to attract not only the opposite gender. I mean, if you're a male and you're like, I got some sperm, let's get together, and you end up with like 50 other males, and you're all sperming each other, that's not going to result in anything. <laughs> so whatever behaviors aren't going to be selected for because there's no progeny. Fail. You know, so these things have to get worked out. But you can see where there can be a complex opportunity for all of these different levels of attraction and awareness, right? And that's a big part of all this. Where I want to go is now we ha need structures to differentiate ourselves and to help us select the most successful, whatever that means. We need to make really good decisions now. Um, not necessarily, though, because you can, with natural selection, we could just all reproduce in this big orgy, and then there are all this craziness of progeny out there, and babies that are, some of them are ridiculously unfit for their environment. And it may have been more like that in the beginning, but over time, I think we developed all of these sophisticated recognition and awareness mechanisms with our sensory apparatuses, apparatus, uh, to sort of make these sort of, you know, to add a psychological element to this whole thing. And, and so to me, that all starts to shift. You know, at first it was probably physical, right? Oh, they, he's got a female part. She's got a female part. Those two parts go together. I could see that with my eyes. I can smell that with my nose. And, and, and I think that became more and more nervous system, right? At first, it might have, be, it might have been more physical muscle, you know, that sort of thing. Coloration, like I'm red, you're blue. That means we do it. Um, and I, so I think that the trend from, say, insects to primates was it became more and more psychological. And I can see where if you look at, you know, primates, the brain and the sophistication of our cerebral and mental capacity is the big one. And why do humans, why do we have imaginations and why do we have all this crazy stuff and like sexual fetishes and all these other weird things that we do or, or weird in the sense that fish don't do it and dogs don't do it and wolves don't, you know, whatever. We have a really sophisticated neurology 
And so I, I, I don't think it's a hard jump to say that sexual reproduction probably was the originator of that line of evolution. We became more and more sophisticated with respect to our reproductive capacity and more and more discerning. And so what, what's, what's related to all that? It wasn't just our brains got bigger, but our, you know, our neurology to our private parts, you know, and orgasms and things like that, that became, you know, part of it. But what about the mental stuff? You know, we, 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 the first thing is sort of this, um, well, an example would be communication. We needed to be able to transmit information between rather than just be like, I'm red and I'm wiggling. That means I'm a male and I'm blue and I'm hiding. And that means I'm a female. Oh, that's our cue. You know, it became much, much more than that. It would be more like would hear some flowers or, or whatever, Right, so communication was probably like super critical, and then the second one being parental care. I mean, go back to that coral example. Let's just release our gametes. You know, if 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 it were that random, we'd be more on that earlier model that I mentioned, where we just have all the babies, everybody reproduces, we share all the gametes, and it's just a crapshoot of what's good or bad and what succeeded. And I imagine it was like that for a while where reproduction was just such that anything could really reproduce with anything. And some things worked out and some things didn't. And maybe 99% of the things just didn't work out. Maybe they weren't even viable because if you have like a dog and a penguin trying to reproduce, they could probably, you know, come close to copulating, but they're not going to produce viable offspring. And so we, you know, we, the flip side of that is sort of the isolation mechanisms that drove us to only to be species. In the last episode, I talked about how before sexual reproduction, there really weren't species because what makes a species a species is reproductive isolation. You can't reproduce with all these other things. And for a while there, it might not have been like that. It might just been this literal orgy of gamete sharing. But that became more and more limiting, more and more focused, more and more isolating, more and more species-driven uh, the further along we move and the more derived that we get. And so communication between individual, let's say moms and dads, became critical. But more than that, it became critical to the group, the species, right? And so now we've got more separation among species driven by the need for reproductive isolation driven by the need for success and not just all this wasted energy producing organisms that aren't, don't even have a chance to be born. And so what does that point to? Communication among community, parental care, and, and what does that get to? So you're my friend. You're not my friend. We have the ability to reproduce. You could be my lover. You could be my wife. We could produce viable offspring together. All of that, I know it sounds absurd and sort of anthropogenic, but that's sort of like the evolutionary conversation that's happening in these increasingly sophisticated bodies and nervous systems that we have. And that points me towards the concepts like awareness. I, I just, I, I have a broader field from which to derive information. I have a more sophisticated network to interpret that information. I can direct my reactions to that information with attention and focus on a specific thing. I'm going to leave this area because I do not see any viable opposing genders that I want to reproduce with. So I will go over here to increase my... That level of interaction at the nervous system and chemical, you know, biological level is is what we see happening as we become more derived. And again, I think that's all related to sex. And so what does that leave us with? Well, that leaves us with these massive networks of receiving environmental stimuli. Let's call that awareness. And where I want to go eventually into the future, and I've thought about this a lot, is how does this relate? How do all these things relate? Consciousness, 
awareness, attention, will, intent. You know, this is getting at sort of what I see as being a human purpose, right? We've we've been gifted this massive ability to perceive our external environment, arguably largely because we want to be successful at reproduction. But it's too much. <laughs> and now that we've sort of figured reproduction out, I would say fairly well, as animals. And then we have, but we still have all this excess information. So something like, it's not hard for me to see something like anxiety as being the reaction to being cued in to receive too much environmental stimulation. Because that's, was useful in order to help us find mates. But now it's just kind of left over. And what do we do with it? And so I think, and this is like where I'll think I'll head with this is, Things like religion, I think about con, con, you know Confucius and, and Buddha and sort of saying, what do we do with this? Like, I think this was an obvious problem. And I think it's an obvious problem that's an artifact of evolution. And maybe that's not the be-all, end-all, but that's a, a, a topic that's worthy of discussion. Um, and, and I think we're all head. And, and I think another general example is sort of just, you know, we can, you can think about this for next time is the degree of parental care. So that's sort of the next step I left out. I skipped ahead for a minute. You know, we spend all this time being able to recognize our mates and and figuring out how to actually have a successful mate. But now we've got to, you know, it's not just like those coral that just say good luck and release your sperm and eggs into the environment and walk away. It's what can I do to increase the likelihood that these individuals are going to persist. And that further supports the idea of community, because if you look at all, uh, you know, well, a lot of early human hominid evolution, it took a village, right? So we we had more of this um, uh, group rearing. uh, And so a lot of energy went into this. And if you, you look at the continuum, it's really weird that like a live bearing fish would basically release a fish into the environment outside of the mother's body for the first time that could feed. It could take care of itself. It could, it's gone. If compare that to a human, you know, our infants are not able to support themselves for years. And so that degree of parental care becomes really critical. And the trickling effort that I'm trying to get towards with love is it's not just about love in a sexual sense, which is kind of the way we think about love primarily. It's between two individuals because they want to have a family and they want to have sex. And that's why love evolved. Well, it goes so much bigger than that because now we need communities to support the rearing of our progeny. And so it becomes this collective. And that's sort of where I want to go with the next episode. Uh, This has been Let's Talk About Sex Part 2. I'm Chris Bercher, and this is Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom, and this was episode 118, I think, and uh, I'll see you guys next week. Take it easy.